I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. At first appearances, it may have looked like Joseph Smith was in a bad situation. He was in custody of an Illinois sheriff and a sheriff from Missouri sent on a special assignment with an order from the state's governors of Missouri and Illinois to bring Joe into Missouri to face trial. Once there, he'd face all of those old charges of the Missouri Mormon War and with being an accessory before the fact in the assassination attempt of ex-governor Lilburn Boggs, shot down in his own home during his campaign for Missouri state senator. Any time that Joseph Smith was arrested, Mormon settlements went in lockdown mode. In response to Joe's personal scribe, William Clayton, bringing intel back to Nauvoo that Joe was arrested, the Nauvoo Legion set out a night watch, and hundreds of legionnaires set out on land and water to search the entire state for Joe's arresting posse. Now, what's interesting here is the lines between state militia and Joe's own private army were very blurry. The Nauvoo Legion was established as a city militia, but in the bylaws of the Nauvoo Charter, they were subject to the command of the Illinois state governor, Thomas Ford. Now, Ford had given the proper paperwork to uh, Sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds for them to arrest Joseph Smith. So, of course, you know, Governor Ford wouldn't want the Nauvoo Legion interfering with the the arrest and extradition that these sheriffs were trying to carry out. But because the prophet was in handcuffs, They were called out, and Nauvoo was placed in a state of emergency, but they were called out at the command of the Nauvoo government. Now, this military made its mission clear in doing so, right? It it existed for the sole purpose of protecting Joseph Smith from the system of law that everybody else abides by. So even though Joe was arrested, he was relatively safe while still in Illinois. Between where he currently was, where his posse currently was, in Dixon, Illinois, and Jackson County, Missouri, right smack dab in the middle of that lay his kingdom on the Mississippi, and the posse would have to pass either near or through Nauvoo in order to get to Missouri. He knew the Legion would be out looking for him, and one of his cronies had arrested the two sheriffs, and he had a writ of habeas corpus to be heard in Quincy, Illinois, in front of a judge who had shown huge favors to Joe and the Mormons for years now. So, if all else failed, Joe had a pistol smuggled to him by another one of his cronies. So, Joseph Smith had his bases covered, even though he was arrested at this time. You know, even with Joe controlling what was happening, though, the situation could still go awry, especially if a rival mob found this posse before the Nauvoo Legion found them. Now, another detail worth including here, as it only adds to the chaos Joe's fellow jail dwellers from his stint in Liberty Jail, that was during the winter of 1838 to 39, they were also in danger of being arrested and brought to trial in Jackson County on those old Missouri charges that Joseph was facing. It wasn't just Joseph Smith who had escaped state custody. Sidney Rigdon had been released, but Alexander McRae, Hiram Smith, and Lyman White, all of these you know, high-ranking Mormon elites, they were all on the same writ of arrest that Sheriff Reynolds used to arrest Joseph Smith. These guys became aware of that fact, and they went into hiding with a small contingency of the Nauvoo Legion as their personal bodyguards. They were armed as well, so the Nauvoo Night Watch was ready to act should anybody with an unfamiliar face wander into town. Now, the Destroying Angel contingent of the Nauvoo Legion organized their men into small companies. So, let me just quickly review what we've been covering for the past couple of episodes. The, the names here, the important names. So we have Sheriff Reynolds and Sheriff Wilson. Those are the two officers who are arresting Joseph Smith who have him under their arrest. Then we have Sheriff Campbell. Sheriff Campbell is the guy who was one of Joseph Smith's cronies who had arrested the two sheriffs that arrested Joseph Smith. So we have these guys... <laughs> There's a a lot of names to kind of keep straight here. We also have William Clayton and Wilson Law. William Clayton was Joseph Smith's personal scribe, and Wilson Law was one of the lieutenant generals of, or sorry, lieutenant colonels of the Nauvoo Legion. So all of these are important names to keep in mind and what side they align on. One more person to keep in mind, Joseph Jackson. 
Joseph Jackson was the guy who decided he wanted to infiltrate the Mormons and gain the favor of Joseph Smith so that he could expose the inner workings of Nauvoo Mormonism at a later time. So Joseph Jackson, in order to gain the fealty of the prophet, he was placed at the head of one of the destroying angel companies of the Nauvoo Legion that was out searching for Joseph Smith. Now, Jackson claims that he deliberately misled some of the, the people in hopes that his company wouldn't be the one to find the prophet, because who knows what would have happened at that point, right? They could be locked in an, in an open gunfight with these two sheriffs. They didn't know how big the arresting posse was that had Joseph Smith in their possession. There was a lot of unknowns operating in the minds of these people. So this is what Joseph Jackson says of him you know, working on behalf of the Nauvoo Legion. Quote, in a few days, William Clayton returned, bringing news that Joe was arrested, and an order immediately issued from Hiram Smith, that's Joseph's brother, of course, for parties to start out to rescue Joe. One party I was placed in and was compelled to go to prevent suspicion on myself. It consisted of 25 men. Our directions were to proceed directly to Dixon and release Joe at all hazards. I acted as pilot, and Dr. Foster that's Bob the Builder, Robert D. Foster, proceeded ahead to reconnoiter. We were all armed with sidearms. On the prairie above La Harp, I led the company astray purposely that Wilson and Reynolds might get ahead. That's the sheriffs who, who had Joseph Smith in their custody. We all got lost and wandered about for a day without making any progress on our journey. End quote. So it wasn't just the Nauvoo Legion that were on high alert at this time. There were newspapers throughout the nation that caught wind that the Mormon prophet, the Muhammad of the Americas, was arrested. And they published the newest intel that they had, reprinting articles that were printed in you know, localities close to Nauvoo who had the earliest and you know, what they thought to be the most reliable information. And the Chicago Democrat was one of these first media outlets to receive word directly from Nauvoo of Joe's arrest. And this was in the form of a letter to the editor of the Chicago Democrat. Quote, Dear Sir, Our little town has been in an unusual state of excitement for the few past days, originating from the arrest of General Joseph Smith, which took place at the Inlet Grove while he was on a visit with his family to a sister who resides there. He was arrested on Friday last by an officer from Hancock County, that's Sheriff Wilson, and delivered over to the Sheriff of Jackson County, that's Sheriff Reynolds, Missouri, in compliance with the orders of the governor. Joseph applied for the benefit of the habeas corpus, and while the lawyers were busy drawing up the necessary papers, the officers frequently asserted that they would not wait, but would leave for the Mississippi at all hazards. They were, however, induced by the force of argument to desist from their intention and wait until morning when the habeas corpus was served, after which they stated their determination to go to Rock Island and by steamboat from thence to Galena before Judge Brown. General Smith justly felt fearful that once on a steamboat he should hardly reach Galena. General Smith, finding this their determination, commenced suit against the sheriff of Missouri for trespass and held him to bail, which he was unable to procure, which circumstance lowered his tune a little, and thus finally today have left for Quincy in search of Judge Young. The severe treatment of the general, together with his pleasing deportment and equanimity under all his trials, has made him many friends and created almost universal sympathy. Persecution or oppression always helps the cause of the persecuted or the oppressed, whether their cause is right or wrong. In haste, yours. Signed, G. End quote. So what happened here? This, this was really early intel, but it was accurate. So this... This idea that Joseph Smith, they were trying to take him by steamer through or down the Mississippi and into St. Louis, and then they would travel straight west towards Jackson County, where they were supposed to, you know, arraign Joseph Smith before a jury trial there. However, he didn't want to go on a steamer because then the Nauvoo Legion would have less chance of seeing him and of rescuing him. So Joseph wanted to travel by land. So Joseph filed a, a a suit against the two sheriffs and claimed that they had abused him. And he apparently showed his bruises to some of his friends and so on and so forth. There's, you know, who knows really? I, I wouldn't be surprised if they abused him a little bit because Joseph Smith wasn't known to, you know, back away from a fight. So needless to say, Joseph Smith wanted to have his hearing in Quincy in front of judge young or in front of judge Adams or judge Douglas or any of the judges that were on the Mormon payroll. Of course, the sheriffs didn't want that. However, because uh, Joseph Smith apparently, you know, was able to file the right documentation, they ended up being forced to head towards Quincy. Now, Quincy, of course, is just a few miles away from Nauvoo. 
and also almost exclusively Mormon. So, and I got to say, the summarizing paragraph at the end of this is really important to keep in mind during this whole trial, right? Persecution and oppression always helps the cause of the persecuted and oppressed. So those unacquainted with the facts of Joseph Smith and the Mormons' relationship with Missouri and all of the history of the war there, they couldn't help but pity the poor, persecuted Mormons. You know, their settlement as religious refugees in Illinois garnered a lot of sympathy of Illinoisans, as well as those living in other northern states. And that, you know, they, they'd been, they, they'd been re resting on the laurels of their religious refugee status for four years now. Missouri, you know, Missouri was already a politically contentious, some might say a politically incorrect state before the Mormon settlement there. You know, they were the northernmost slave state. They were very contentious. They, a lot of the northern states viewed Missouri as the pinnacle of backwards as far as society is, was headed. So the Mormons being chased out of that state only played into the public perceptions of Missourians as backwards and these, you know, these state rights kind of Southern Democrats, these slave drivers. But as we know, the truth is always more nuanced, right? Especially when it comes to the Mormons in Missouri. So needless to say, Joe was in a state of friends, that was Illinois, while Sheriff Reynolds was in a hostile territory, and he was in the custody of the Lee County Sheriff, that's Sheriff Campbell, and he was in that sheriff was loyal to Joseph Smith. So Reynolds and Wilson, the sheriffs that had Joseph Smith in their custody, they were continuing to run out of options while time was only on Joseph Smith's side. So the New York Herald. Now, to review, the New York Herald was the paper that was run by James Gordon Bennett. James Gordon Bennett is a guy that we talked about, you know, about two months ago. And he's a guy who had been awarded a position of Inspector General of the Nauvoo Legion. He'd been given an honorary doctorate from the University of Nauvoo. He printed, uh, you know, a, a ton of articles on the Mormons. And he was also the first person to publish an expose on the Mormons back in 1831. So James Gordon Bennett published the earliest article that I can find about the arrest. And of course, the general tone of the report shows just how much Gordon Bennett didn't actually buy into the Mormon religion, but was merely using it for the political opportunities and, of course, to sell papers, because any paper at this time that had Mormon in the headline, it flew off the shelves. Now, once again, I, I have to say this. This is the age when information traveled at the speed of a horse. So the papers ran a week or so lag from the actual events. But here it is from July 2nd, 1843, quote, Arrest of Joe Smith, the Mormon prophet. We have received the following letter acquainting us of the arrest of Joe Smith, which we publish as it was received. Dear Sir, I hasten to inform you of the arrival in our town this afternoon of the far-famed Joseph Smith, who was captured this afternoon a few miles from this place by the sheriff of Jackson County, Missouri, charged with treason against the state, advantage being taken of his absence from his stronghold while on a visit to some of his relatives in this neighborhood. The sheriff has been delayed a short time to await the arrival of Judge Brown in this district, who is momentarily expected to arrive with the pretense of obtaining a writ of habeas corpus when he will probably be taken before Judge Pope. If not, he will be taken to Missouri to be disposed of, perhaps the citizens may deem proper. Now, the person who wrote this letter, it's just signed S. We don't know who it is. It came from Dixon, where Joseph Smith was staying very briefly, uh, where the sheriffs had him arrested, right? If they could get this writ of habeas corpus hearing in front of Judge Pope, that was in Springfield, which is, you know, a bit of a detour from where they were, you know, Joseph Smith was trying to go, which was Nauvoo or Quincy. But Judge Pope was a guy who had given Joseph Smith, you know, released Joseph Smith on the writ of uh, habeas corpus back in the January hearing when he was initially arrested for the Lilburn Boggs assassination, right? So if they could get the hearing in front of Judge Pope again, maybe he would be just as liberal with his assessment of this case. So that's why they wanted to get in front of Judge Pope. But Judge Brown, of course, he wasn't in the pockets of the Mormons. So Judge Brown was somebody who it was very convenient for Joseph Smith that he happened to be visiting New York at this time. It concludes, he says he is willing to be tried in Illinois, but will not be taken to Missouri. <laughs> uh, it, you know, dead or alive, you can assume, right? I presume he has not had a revelation lately, or he would not have been caught so far from home where he has been easily taken by two men. <laughs> if only he was a prophet, he could have foreseen his arrest, of course. The mail is just closing, and I have not time to say more. Signed, S. End quote. So, 
Yeah, that kind of sets the scene for what's going on here. They have Joseph Smith in his, in their custody. The sheriffs have Joseph Smith in their custody. Joseph Smith's buddy has the sheriffs in his custody, and they are traveling through the state of Illinois. The The Missouri sheriff just wants to get Joseph Smith across the state line into Missouri where there was a party waiting for them to transfer them to Jackson County. But Joseph Smith wanted nothing less in this world than to step foot in the state of Missouri because as soon as he did, he knew his life was over. So Joseph Smith was trying to bide his time, trying to stay in Illinois long enough for the Nauvoo Legion to catch up to his posse. So we're going to pick up where we left off from Joe's own account in Volume 5 of the History of the Church. I'm reading from the Dan Vogel edition, beginning on page 476 of Volume 5. Now, this first entry shows just how much Joe was actually in control of this situation, even if it, there was a lot of chaos happening. As they continued to progress through Illinois, Joe gathered an, ex- an increasingly larger posse of his, you know, howler monkey sycophants ready to jump on any advantage they could gain over the sheriffs. And of course, the sheriffs knew that they were not safe with Joe in their custody in the state of Illinois, and every new addition to the posse made them more nervous from Joseph Smith's own account. Quote, While crossing Fox River, I requested Reynolds to give me the privilege of riding on horseback, which he refused. But by the intercession of Sheriff Campbell, now Sheriff Campbell, that's the sheriff who had the uh, Sheriff Wilson and Reynolds, the people arresting Joseph Smith, in his custody. Sheriff Campbell is Joe's friend here. Also, one more name to remember here, Cyrus Walker. That's Joe's legal counsel. So... But by the intercession of Sheriff Campbell and Mr. Cyrus Walker, Walker took my seat in the stagecoach and I his in the buggy with Mr. Montgomery, son-in-law and student of Cyrus Walker. In about two miles, we met Peter W. Conover and William L. Cutler and shook hands with both of them at the same time and could not refrain from tears at seeing the first of my friends come to meet me and then said to Mr. Montgomery, I am not going to Missouri this time. These are my boys, end quote. So they were traveling along through Illinois, crossing the Fox River. Joe's boys, Peter Conover and William L. Cutler, members of the Nauvoo Legion, just stumbled upon them. And as soon as they arrived, Joseph Smith turned towards Mr. Montgomery. I'm not going to Missouri. These are my boys. It's like a mafia boss, right? This is this is history that is stranger than fiction. You know, some of Joe's friends found them on this road from Dixon to Quincy. He jumped off of his horse, embraced his friends, you know, shed tears of joy and happiness. And that's when he returned to his arresting agents and says, I'm not going anywhere. I got my boys here. So now Joe's boys outnumbered these two arresting sheriffs by five to one. The posse was under the control of Joe's boys, the sheriff from Lee County, right? That's Sheriff Campbell. He was under Joe's control as well. So what this means is from Joe's perspective, this must have been a relief. I mean, Joseph Smith knew he was in trouble, right? He knew what he had done and that the state of Missouri had him dead to rights. Until his boys appeared, he wasn't sure that he'd make it out of this situation alive. But as soon as they showed up, Joe knew that he was safe. And all that was left was to see out the rest of this journey and group up with more of the Danites who he knew were out searching for him. Now, consider this from the perspective of the sheriffs, though, right? The arresting sheriff, sheriffs Reynolds and Wilson. They must have thought that that they had a chance to get Joe into Missouri before Joe's boys arrived. Now, his boys were there They just had to make it back to their own homes with their own lives intact, right? They were in increasingly more danger the more time they spent in the state of Illinois. Now, the way that Joe reports this whole situation makes it sound like the the sense of fear was beginning to settle in for these two sheriffs who were merely, you know, executing the due process of law. That's all they were doing. They were just doing their job. But their lives were threatened. Quote, While we were talking, Stephen Markham, that's, you know, one of Joe's primary boys. Stephen Markham was the guy who was there with Joseph Smith when he was arrested. Stephen Markham was the guy who ran up to Joseph Smith when the sheriffs were pointing guns at Joseph. And the sheriffs turned and pointed the gun back at Markham and told him to stop. And he didn't stop. And they had to point the guns at Joseph Smith and say, if you don't stop running at us, we're going to kill Joseph Smith. Um, 
that's Stephen Markham. He's he's in the he's by Joe's side for all of this. So uh, I'll continue on. While we were talking, Stephen Markham with Captain Thomas Grover and the other five brethren rode up. At the same time, the company who started with me from Dixon rode up. I then said to Reynolds, Now, Reynolds, I can have the privilege of riding old Joe Duncan. That's Joe Duncan is Joe's favorite horse. His, his favorite horse that was in the posse anyway. Because old Charlie wasn't there at this time. It was Joe Duncan. And mounted my favorite horse. And the entire company then rode towards a farmhouse where we made a halt. Reynolds and Wilson, who trembled much, then rode up to Conover, who was an old acquaintance of Wilson's. When Conover asked Wilson, what is the matter with you? Have you got the ague? Wilson replied, no. Reynolds asked, is Jim Flack in the crowd? And was answered, he is not now, but you will see him tomorrow about this time. Then said Reynolds, I am a dead man, for I know him of old. Conover told him not to be frightened, for he would not be hurt. Right, there's there's a lot of... A lot, a lot of tension here. Reynolds was an enemy of the state of Illinois because the state of Illinois was in the control of Joseph Smith at this time. He had Joseph Smith in his possession, uh, his custody, I should say. Every minute that he was not on guard was a minute that he could get shot. So, you know, he was looking for his friend, Jim Flack. But they said, uh, he's not he's not around. He's not he'll he'll be here tomorrow. And that's when Reynolds says, well, it's nightfall. I'm a dead man. Reynolds stood trembling like an aspen leaf when Markham walked up to him and shook hands with him. Reynolds said, do I meet you as a friend? I expect to be a dead man when I meet you again. Markham replied, we are friends except in law. That must have its course. The company moved on to Andover, where the sheriff of Lee County requested lodgings for the night for all the company. I was put into a room and locked up with Captain Grover. It was reported to me that some of the brethren had been drinking whiskey that day in violation of the word of wisdom. I called the brethren in and investigated the case and was satisfied that no evil had been done and gave them a couple of dollars with directions to replenish the bottle to stimulate them in the fatigues of their sleepless journey. End quote. Celebration time. You know. Sheriff Reynolds here is trembling like an aspen leaf, afraid that he's going to die because he's surrounded by Danites, and then he has Joseph Smith in his legal custody. And then a couple of Joe's boys came in here drunk. Hey, were you guys violating the law of wisdom by drinking whiskey? No? Okay, well, did you cause any trouble while you were drunk? No? Okay. Here's a couple of bucks. Let's keep this party rolling. That's uh, it's a profit of uh, Mormonism for you. Now, lucky for Joe, the Nauvoo legionnaire who met them first, Peter Conover, brought Joseph Smith a six-shooter pistol to exchange for the single shooter that Markham had first smuggled to him. So now Joe could actually be useful for more than one shot if it came down to a fight. And hopefully it wouldn't come down to that, right? The posse was about 100 miles off from Nauvoo now in a town called Andover, Illinois. And that's where they were staying at a person's farm for the night. Now, what is interesting here is Joseph Smith became privy to the owner of the farm and the two sheriffs hatching a plan to run off with Joe in the middle of the night away from the Lee County Sheriff, the Sheriff Campbell, who had the two sheriffs in his custody, right? And once the once Sheriff Reynolds and Wilson had Joseph Smith in their custody and not under the watchful eye of any of the Danites, they'd be free to drag him across a state line into Missouri where there was a party waiting to receive them. But when Joe told the Lee County Sheriff, you know, his crony, the sheriff commissioned some of Joe's boys to stand as a night watch to make sure that nobody entered or left the farmhouse. So Joe became privy to the plan and he thwarted it. The next day, Joe called his boys together to hatch their own plan. Their own plan was to travel by land straight to Nauvoo, get the prophet safe, right? He did not want to travel by water, by steamer. It'd be easier to conceal him if they did. Sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds did not like the plan. They knew that they would be killed the longer they were standing on Illinois soil. Once they were on the Mississippi, it was a different different plan, right? But, you know, if they were forced to enter Nauvoo, they thought that they would certainly be killed once they entered the city limits. This is how it went down according to Joe's account. Quote, Went to a little grove at the head of Elliston Creek where we stayed an hour to feed our animals. Sheriff Reynolds said, now we will go from here to the mouth of Rock River and take steamboats to Quincy. Stephen Markham said, No, for we are prepared to travel and will go on land. 
Wilson and Reynolds both spoke and said, No, by God, we won't. We will never go by Nauvoo alive. And both drew their pistols on Markham, who turned around to Sheriff Campbell of Lee County, saying, When these men took Joseph a prisoner, they took his arms from him, even to his pocket knife. They are now prisoners of yours, and I demand of you to take their arms from them, for that is according to law. End quote. This is a really interesting interaction, right? Wilson, Reynolds, they want to go by water. Markham says, we're going by land. They says, no, 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 we are not going by land because if we go to Nauvoo, we're going to die. They get in an argument and the two sheriffs pull their pistols on Stephen Markham. Stephen Markham commands Sheriff Campbell, <laughs> remove them of their weapons, relieve them of their arms, right? Well, consider the power dynamics. Sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds, they were on special appointment from the governors of Missouri and Illinois, but they were just sheriffs. Stephen Markham was a Joe crony since he had joined the church back in 1837, but he was also a lieutenant colonel of the Nauvoo Legion and also a city alderman. Stephen Markham outranked these guys in civil and military offices. Technically speaking, he even had the military jurisdiction to tell the Lee County Sheriff to relieve these other sheriffs of their arms. <laughs> you know, it's a private military. That's what happens. And of course, as a lieutenant colonel of the Nauvoo Legion, Joe was lieutenant general. So everybody in the posse was subject to Joe's military command because the Nauvoo Legion was an officially recognized state militia with full military powers. Now, add into that, the posse had only two guys that had Joe under their arrest, while there were more than 10 of Joe's boys there to defend him. So even in custody of these two sheriffs, Joe was completely untouchable. The sheriffs knew this, the Lee County Sheriff knew this, Stephen Markham knew this, and most importantly, Joseph Smith knew that he was untouchable. This is how it went down. Quote, they refused to give them up when the sheriff was told, if you cannot take the arms from them, there are men enough here and you can summon a posse to do it, for it is plain to be seen they are dangerous men. That's yeah, what Stephen Markham said to Sheriff Campbell after he told him to uh, relieve them of their arms. Reynolds and Wilson then reluctantly gave up their arms to the sheriff. The company then started taking the middle road towards Nauvoo to within six miles of Monmouth and start, stopped at a farmhouse, having traveled about 40 miles, got there about sundown and called for supper and lodging, end quote. Traveling by land, taking the middle road, the most traveled road, you know, they're trying to stay on public highways because, you know, the Danites are probably traveling over public highways. They have more chance of running into them. So they spent the night at Monmouth at this farmhouse. And now the sheriffs were getting desperate at this point, right? If they made it to Nauvoo with profit in their custody, they thought that they wouldn't leave the city alive. If they could just get Joe away from his boys for just a minute, they had a chance. So the sheriffs began devising a plan with the young boy who lived in the farmhouse. The sheriffs, however, didn't know that Joe's boy, Peter Conover, was spying on them while they were devising their plan. So he listened intently and then relayed the plans to Joseph Smith. And Joe responded by having the Lee County Sheriff confine Sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds in the upper chamber of the farmhouse with some of his boys as Night's Watch. Now, this is interesting, too, right? So the sheriffs were trying to get Joe away from his boys. Joe had the situation under control. He could just leave in the middle of the night while these two sheriffs are sleeping and they would be fine. But then he would be a fugitive from justice. If Joe just, if he just was successful in biding his time, if he just went to court with a writ of habeas corpus that he had in his hand, that he was ready to have heard in front of a Quincy a judge, he could get released under the color of law. But if he runs away, then, well... He's a fugitive from justice, and he's going to be forced to be arrested by, you know, Governor Ford of Illinois. So he was playing it smart here. He could have run at any point. He had enough bodyguards to make the trip safely. He could have run, but he was smart and did not. So the sheriffs, this is their final ditch effort plan to get Joe to Missouri. And because Peter Conover was spying on them and told this to Joseph Smith, the plan failed. And what's crazy is Nauvoo lay on the horizon just two days out. They were getting closer to the city, and the closer you got to Nauvoo in Illinois, 
the more dense of population it became of Mormons, right? So just about any farmhouse that they called on to stay in for the next two days would undoubtedly be a Mormon. Sheriff Reynolds and Wilson were traveling down the esophagus of the beast. They were headed for the belly. Now, one of the destroying angel companies was led by a guy named Albert P. Rockwood. He's made a few small appearances in our timeline before now. You know, he's never gained a nickname or anything. He's, he hasn't really figured that heavily into our timeline. He was ordained into the Quorum of the Seventy during the Mormon exodus from Missouri to Illinois by Bloody Brigham Young. Uh, Albert P. Rock, oh, Brigham Young was in charge of the entire logistics of the exodus from Missouri to Illinois in 1839. But uh, he, he determined that Albert P. Rockwood would be the drill officer of the Nauvoo Legion. And then Rockwood later became a general of the Nauvoo Legion. Now, um, what's interesting here, just a little side note, some of the news reports that went out about the Lilburn Boggs assassination attempt, that was back in May of 1842, they had confused O. Rockwell with A. Rockwood, right? Orrin Porter Rockwell versus Albert P. Rockwood. And some people actually suspected A. Rockwood of being the assassin, but that, that was not the case, right? Orrin Porter Rockwell was the guy who was actually fingered for it, and he was currently sitting in jail. So Rockwood, Albert P. Rockwood, kept a journal during this time. He was one of the leading generals of the Nauvoo Legion here, and he recorded this situation and what it was like in his company of the Destroying Angels. Um, they were closing in on the Prophet's arresting posse, but I'm going to let Albert P. Rockwood tell it from his own pen. Quote, On arriving near the farmhouse where the posse stayed last night, we learned that they had been gone about two hours. Then General Wilson Law, that's one of Joe's boys, said, Now, boys, comes the tug of war. Every man and horse try your best. And away we went with our blood at fighting heat. At a watering place about three miles from the river, General Wilson Law and William Law, Elisha Everett, A.P. Rockwood, and about one or two others took passage in a wagon. Having comparatively fresh animals, we left most of the detachment in the rear. Yet Brother King Follett and from five to ten others were up with us, positively charged with fight, but few if any men negatively charged. While in the wagon, Wilson Law remarked, We must overhaul them before they can get on the ferry boat to cross the river, and we must take the stand that Joseph should not be taken over the river. Therefore, prepare yourselves for the best licks, for if Joseph goes into Missouri, they will kill him, and that will break us up, as our property in Nauvoo will become useless or of no value. You know, really keeping his priorities straight, right, Wilson Law? During the conversation, we emerged from the timber and saw a small village in the distance less than half a mile on the bank of the river. We put our animals at their full speed and charged in with drawn swords, our guns and pistols cocked and primed, ready for attack. Our sudden appearance and hostile movements caused much excitement in the village. General Wilson Law jumped from the wagon, ran into the tavern. Soon a man came out and forced the contents of a bottle of spirits down his horse. Some of our horses fell to the ground as soon as we halted. All were foaming with sweat and nearly exhausted. Some of the citizens refused to give us any information. Others declared, I have done nothing, and expressed their fears and anxieties in various ways. I mean, you have to put yourself in their shoes, right? You're just minding your own business in this little town. Um, the Danites think that they have uh, fresh tracks to chase and you're, you're just minding your own business. And then a whole bunch of guys come riding into town with their swords out, guns and pistols cocked and primed, ready for attack. You don't know what's going on. I've done nothing. I swear. No, I'm not guilty. What, I, what is happening here? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. I have done nothing and expressed their fears and anxieties in various ways. I ran down the, to the river and down the beach while William Law ran up, each in search of the ferry boat, which happened to be on the other side. No tracks or other evidence could be found by us that any persons had passed the river this morning. Wilson Law was at this time making inquiries of the citizens. So, yeah, Albert P. Rockwood is, you know, checking on the ferry on the other side of the river, hoping that they didn't cross. Uh, <laughs> Wilson Law is shaking down the citizens, grabbing them by the collars. Where is Joseph Smith? Where is the prophet? We don't know. I mean, it's just chaos. Some of the horsemen rode on at full speed through the village of Okwaka in search of the prophet, while others left their exhausted horses standing or lying in the streets and ran on foot. 
We concluded that the posse, knowing that we were nearby to rescue, had taken to the woods to secrete themselves or evade us. Therefore, Brother King Follett and such others could gather as they came in, were ordered to search the timbers, and in a short time, a wayfaring man reported he had seen a company passing down the river road below the village. This I immediately reported, whereupon all hands were ordered to the pursuit. Soon the village was clear of the destroying angels, and they were left to their own reflections and meditations on the strange scene that had passed before them. Those who were in the rear of our detachment saw the posse who had Joseph traveling down the river road, end quote. And at a small farmhouse in Monmouth, near the river road, is where this destroying angel company of the Denites found Joe's posse. And now we return to Joseph Smith's account, quote, while staying at this farmhouse, General Wilson and William Law and about 60 men came up in several little squads. I walked out several rods to meet the company. William and Wilson Law jumped from their horses and unitedly hugged and kissed me while many tears of joy were shed. End quote. They were a single day's ride from Nauvoo, and the posse now had nearly 100 of Joe's boys ready to fight. We cannot imagine what was going through the minds of Sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds at this moment, right? Joe called <laughs> a friend's house, uh, this is Brother Crane, and asked him to have, his, uh, have a supper prepared for 100 men. They killed a flock of turkeys and chickens to satisfy the appetites of these hungry, destroying angels and, uh, of course, these gentlemen of the law. But they had one day left of travel before they got to Nauvoo. <laughs> I mean, what do you do as the sheriffs, Wilson and, and Reynolds? What do you do? You're completely stuck. You're in the custody of somebody who's Joe's crony. <sighs> but what is interesting is the leadership in Nauvoo, right? They had no idea of what was going on outside of Nauvoo, right? I, I mean, Intel traveled at the speed of the horse. They had no idea whether Joe had been rescued, whether he was being taken on a steamer, you know, right on the Mississippi, right outside of Nauvoo. They, they had no idea what was going on. They just left it to the hands of the Danites to find the prophet, right? So the city was still on high alert and the night watch had twice been doubled in order to accost any suspicious looking persons. Now, some people that the Legion approached, you know, to question them, you know, what's your business here? You know, an unfamiliar person is in the city. That might be a Missouri spy, right? So the Nauvoo Legion probably approached some people and then the people complained about search and seizure without, you know, a warrant or color of law. So the city government called a special meeting and passed a broad and sweeping bill to take effect immediately upon passage. This ordinance was titled An Ordinance Concerning Strangers and contagious diseases, and for other purposes. Now, I'm going to read a bit of this to you, and you'll see what I mean by broad and sweeping, and because we'll talk about the powers that this actually affords after reading through a bit of it here. I'll, I'll, trust me, I'll summarize. Just bear with me. Section 1. Be it ordained by the city council of the city of Nauvoo for the peace, benefit, good order, convenience, cleanliness, health, and happiness of said city, agreeable to the charter of the same city, that the city council, marshal, constables, and city watch are hereby authorized, empowered, and required to require all strangers who shall be entering the city or are already tearing or may hereafter be tearing in said city in a civil and respectful manner to give their names, former residents, for what intent they have entered or are tearing in the city, and answer such other questions as the officer shall deem proper or necessary for the good order, health, or convenience of the said city." And for failure or refusal on the part of the strangers to give the desired information, they, su they shall be subject to the penalty of the ordinance concerning vagrants and disorderly persons, which is to say, they shall be arrested. Section 2. And be it further ordained that the aforesaid authorities of said city are further authorized and empowered and required to hail and take all persons found strolling about the city at night after 9 o'clock and before sunrise, and to confine them in ward for trial, according to the aforesaid ordinance concerning vagrants and disorderly persons, unless they give a good and satisfactory account of themselves or offer a reasonable excuse for being thus caught out after nine o'clock. 
Section 4. And be it further ordained that the aforesaid authorities are further authorized, empowered, and required to enter all hotels or houses of public entertainment and such other habitations as they may judge proper and require the inmates to give immediate information of all persons residing in said hotel or habitation and their business occupation or movements and for a failure, noncompliance, or false information, their license shall be forfeit if it be a public house, and they, the transient persons, subject to the penalties of the three preceding sections. Signed, Daniel H. Wells, President Pro Tempore, passed June 29th, 1843. Signed, also, James Sloan, City Recorder. End quote. So what did this ordinance do? Why did I just read that? Basically, if somebody wandered into town that people didn't recognize, now any member of the government or the Nauvoo Legion, an alderman, a city council member, a constable, they could just walk up to that stranger and ask them what their business was in the city. If the person didn't have an answer, they would be arrested and thrown in jail for an alderman to interrogate them. It also established a curfew of 9 p.m. So if anybody was out after 9 uh, and before sunrise without a good excuse, they'd be arrested as well. It also allowed any of those legionnaires, the constables, aldermen, or any government official to enter any public house or hotel and question anybody that they wanted to. And if the house didn't comply, they would have their license revoked and the person in question would still be arrested. <laughs> I mean... At no point did the history of the church state that martial law was declared in Nauvoo at this time, but that's what this is. This is martial law. People in Nauvoo, Mormon or not, they had no true rights. I mean, they were subjected to absolute dictatorial rule and Orwellian dragnet surveillance here. The Night Watch had dozens or hundreds of Nauvoo legionnaires staked out in public locations all night, while daytime had a smaller contingent that were capped out on street corners. And all of this is happening while the Whistling and Whittling Brigade kept constant watch for any unfamiliar faces. Now, just to review, the Whistling Whittling Brigade, those were, yeah, you know, young men anywhere from, you know, eight years old to maybe early 20s who just sat on street corners and had no other job than just whittling wood with their bowie knives, watching for any intruders. And if any intruders happened to step into town... The whistling whittlers would just keep whistling and whittling and just follow them around town, brandishing those bowie knives, just whittling away, whittling away, whistling ominously. The whole town, I mean, this is a town of something like 10,000 people. If you didn't know your neighbors or they didn't know you or worse, if somebody suspected you of suspicious conduct, you were subject to immediate arrest and interrogation by the city police, and you were treated as a vagrant, a second-class citizen. That is quite interesting. Now, what this means is if you weren't Mormon or rich and powerful and you found yourself in Nauvoo, it was a hostile place to be. Now, going back to Joseph Jackson, we read a little bit from his account at the very beginning. He's the dude who's you know trying to infiltrate the Mormons, trying to gain Joseph's trust. He went on the... Uh, with the supposed mission to go break Porter Rockwell out of jail and finish off the Lilburn Boggs job, but he failed his mission. Came back to uh, Nauvoo and, you know, further gained Joseph's uh, attention. Uh, you know, we, we read through quite a bit of his account last episode. So Joseph Jackson, his first incident in Nauvoo, he was there just a few days as an outsider, and then somebody tried to kill him in the darkness of night simply because nobody in the city knew who he was and they suspected him to be a Missouri spy. Well, he was, but, I mean, they suspected it and they tried to kill him. Now, such an occurrence wouldn't happen again because city government officials had the authority and were required by this new ordinance to arrest anybody like Jackson who just shows up and then subject them to interrogation. Who knows what that looked like? This is the protectionism with which this city of Nauvoo guarded itself. Passing this ordinance also allowed them to thwart any possible extradition party that may be forming in the city, right? <laughs> because before, before the sheriffs found Joe and arrested him near Dixon, the sheriffs had gone to Nauvoo where they you know, learned that Joe was at Inlet Grove and that's where they made the arrest, right? But had this ordinance existed at the time, the Nauvoo constable could have just seen Sheriff Wilson and Sheriff Reynolds come into town and immediately arrest them and question them, see what's going on, 
And, you know, they could find out their intentions and they could hold them in the city for as long as they wanted to. Now, it's interesting because if a member of the the Mormon elite had found out that these guys were headed to arrest Joe, they probably never would have left Nauvoo, right? Or at least they wouldn't <laughs> have without, you know, ample time for a messenger to reach Joe a few days before the sheriffs did, you know. So that little oversight that allowed the sheriffs to just come into Nauvoo, ask some questions about where the prophet is, and then find him, that little oversight was no longer a problem. And the Nauvoo Legion, constables, aldermen, anybody who was a government official in Nauvoo had total and complete authority to arrest anybody that they wanted to. For any reason, really. Any justifiable reason. So to go back, the posse, at the time that this was passed, that was June 29th, they were just a single day out from Nauvoo, half a day's horse ride. So Joe sent Dr. Bob the Builder, Robert D. Foster, ahead of the company to go tell people in Nauvoo that the posse would be arriving the next day. He requested the band and the Nauvoo Legion and to be present to make a proper entrance. Of course. The thing is, what happened here? Joe's plan worked perfectly. Everybody in town was notified that the prophet was going to safely return the next day. Quote, At 10 o'clock, the Nauvoo Brass Band and Marshall Band started with Emma and my brother Hiram to meet me, also a train of carriages containing a number of the principal inhabitants. Read Mormon elites. End quote. The scene that follows. Now this, <laughs> it's amazing. Well, I'm going to just read it from Joseph's own account. This is where he's in his element. Right, He made the grand entrance into the city with the band playing, his friends surrounding him, hundreds of Nauvoo legionnaires armed and in formation at his sides, the entire posse trotting in on horses and carriages, slowly sauntering towards the city, knowing that they had just triumphed over their enemies. Joe's friends and family waiting for him in his entrance while his captors were in the custody of Colonel Stephen Markham. It's theatrical. It's grandiose. It's exactly what Joe wanted. And he also summarized the sequence of, you know, the entire week's events pretty well in this little chunk that I'm going to read. So here it is, volume five of the history of the church. Quote, at 8 a.m., the company with me again started, arrived at Big Mound at about 10 and a half, well, 1030, where the brethren decorated the bridles of their horses with flowers of the prairie and were met by a number of the citizens. Continued our journey, and at 11.25 I was gladdened when opposite my brother Hiram's farm, about one and a half miles east of the temple, with seeing the train approaching towards us, and I directed Colonel Albert P. Rockwood to place my lifeguards in their appropriate position in the procession. This is Joe in his element making his entrance. I was in a buggy with Mr. Montgomery, Sheriff Reynolds and Wilson with my three lawyers, Cyrus Walker, Shepard G. Patrick, and Edward Southwick were in the stagecoach with Lucian P. Sanger, a bunch of names that don't really matter except for Cyrus Walker there. The stage proprietor, Mr. Campbell, the sheriff of Lee County, and a company of about 140 with, were with me on horseback. I was a prisoner in the hands of Reynolds, the agent of Missouri, and Wilson, his assistant. They were prisoners in the hands of Sheriff Campbell, who had delivered the whole of us into the hands of Colonel Markham, guarded by my friends, so that none of us could escape. When the company from the city came up, I said I thought I would now ride a little easier, got out of the buggy, and after embracing Emma and my brother Hiram, who wept tears of joy at my return, as did almost all of the great company who surrounded us, it was a solemn, silent meaning. I mounted my favorite horse, Old Charlie, when the band struck up Hail Columbia and proceeded to march slowly towards the city, Emma riding by my side into town. The carriages having formed in a line, the company with me following next, and the citizens fell in the rear. As we approached the city, the scene continued to grow more interesting. The streets were generally lined on both sides with the brethren and sisters, whose countenances were joyous and full of satisfaction to see me once more safe. I was greeted with the cheers of the people and firing of guns and cannon. We were obliged to appoint a number of men to keep the streets open for the procession to pass, and arrived at my house about one o'clock, where my aged mother was at the door to embrace me with tears of joy rolling down her cheeks, and my children clung around me with feelings of enthusiastic and enraptured pleasure. Little Fred exclaimed, Pa, the Missourians won't take you away again, will they? End quote. 
What we have in front of us is an ingredient list for a persecution complex. The prophet of God being tragically arrested and nearly being taken to Missouri by the vicious mobocrats triumphantly gets rescued by his followers before facing the gallows. His family and friends all lining the streets with the band playing the president of the United States entrance song as he boldly rides his own favorite horse old Charlie into town with his captors under the control of his own personal army. Then he heroically jumps off of his horse, embraces his mother, mother, his wife, his six-year-old son, Joseph Smith, had evaded death once again. It would have been pretty inspiring to be a Mormon living in Nauvoo at this time, right? You know, you hear that the prophet had just been kidnapped by Missourian mobocrats. You've gone through all of the trials of the Missouri Mormon War just a few years ago. Some of your best friends were killed at Hans Mill Massacre by these evil mobocrats. And now all that old trauma comes back. The prophet's arrested again. Five days of being completely terrified, receiving no intel, not knowing the whereabouts of your prophet. Then the Nauvoo Legion is out in full force, patrolling the streets, stopping any further loss of control, stopping any strangers that are prowling about the town and arresting them. You know, if these people captured the prophet again and they locked him up, What was to stop the Illinois government from exterminating the Mormons the way that the Missouri government had done? You know, it was all history and repeat again. All of the old trauma from the Missouri Mormon War was coming back to these thousands of people who had suffered because of it. Anxiety, fear, uncertainty, all of these emotions riling up the Mormons into a fervor. And then the prophet strolls into town with the band playing, flanked by hundreds of his legionnaire bodyguards safe once again. The prophet had triumphed over his Missouri oppressors. You know, if you've seen this, the, uh, the American prophet movie that the church put out in 2005, this scene is actually depicted, you know, it's pretty quick. Joe's kidnapped. He's taken into a carriage towards Missouri. And then dozens of guys ride up on horses and spring the prophet. You know, not only did this play into the persecution narrative of the Mormons living in 1843 Nauvoo, this scene plays into the persecution narrative To this day, nearly two centuries later. And of course, as the scene is depicted in that movie from 2005, these two sheriffs were the guests of honor at the feast Joseph Smith had had at his house after they arrived back in Nauvoo. Once again, from volume five of the history of the church, quote, The multitude seemed unwilling to disperse until after I had arisen on the fence and told them, I am out of the hands of the Missourians again. Thank God. I thank you all for your kindness and love to me. I bless you all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I shall address you at the grove near the temple at four o'clock this afternoon. At this information, the assembly began to disperse. When I went to dinner with my family, Reynolds and Wilson were placed at the head of the table with about 50 of my friends and were served the best that the table afforded by my wife, whom they refused to allow me to see when they so cruelly arrested and ill-treated me, which contrasted strongly with their treatment to me when I was first arrested by them and until my friends met me. Somehow, Joseph Smith always wins. But if we view this whole situation from a purely legal standpoint, Joseph Smith was a criminal. He had committed high treason against the state of Missouri, forming his own private military without state sanction. Then he used that military to burn towns to the ground and pillage the Gentile belongings. His men had taken Missouri militiamen as prisoners of war, one of which they shot after quote unquote releasing him from captivity. Joseph Smith had waged open war against the Missouri militia, which ended in a tense standoff and eventual surrender when the Mormons were finally outnumbered three to one by the Missouri militia. After languishing in jail for five months when Joseph Smith should have faced the death penalty and was facing the death penalty, Joe escaped state custody and fled Missouri as a fugitive from justice. Then one of his boys comes back two years later with a vendetta against Lilburn Boggs and nearly kills him in his own house. All of this Joe was able to do because his political and military power had exceeded the power of any other living human being in America at this time, any single private citizen. Given the legal standards of the day, Joseph Smith deserved the death penalty. There's simply no argument to be made to the contrary. So, Joe was home. 
How did this all end up playing out? Even though Joe was in Nauvoo now, he was still in the custody, technically, of the sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds. And they were in the custody of Stephen Markham as, you know, he was a superior officer of the state sanctioned militia. Joe had his writ of habeas corpus, as did the sheriffs. They were scheduled to be heard by Stephen A. Douglas in Quincy. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite that simple. So I'm just going to cut to the punchline here. Joseph Smith was ordered to be released on his writ of habeas corpus. The proceedings of the hearing and, of course, the aftermath of sorting out all of this mess extends for the next nearly 150 pages in the volume five of the history of the church. And don't worry, as always, I'm going to read through all of it and tell you how it all went down, you know, in the next episode or two. Just keep in mind that this is how it all ended up working out. Joe got off scot-free. Now, a lot of letters during this time were exchanged among Mormon elites, Sheriff Reynolds of Missouri, Governor Reynolds of, of uh, Missouri, and Governor Ford of Illinois, and of course, uh, you know, Joseph Smith sure sent out his fair share of documents as well. So the thing is, Joe was heartily represented by Cyrus Walker. Uh, Joe, Joe had acquired Cyrus Walker when he was first arrested. He had heard that Cyrus Walker was the best criminal defense lawyer in the state of Illinois. He was out campaigning for himself to be elected to Congress. Joseph Smith promised Cyrus Walker the Mormon vote if Walker agreed to represent Joe. We're going to see how that turns out for Walker when we get to the 1843 elections. But this is how Governor Thomas Ford summarizes what happened in this entire event in his 1852 book, History of Illinois. This was published posthumously. This is kind of a long read, but he deals with everything for, you know, that we've discussed in this and last episode in about a page and a half from his own perspective as governor of Illinois at this time. So please bear with me. He just introduces a lot of nuance and a new perspective into this whole situation. Quote, on the 7th of June, a messenger from Missouri presented himself to me with a copy of the indictment and a new demand from the governor of Missouri. That's Governor Reynolds. A new warrant in pursuance of the Constitution of the United States was issued and placed in the hands of a constable in Hancock County. That's Harmon T. Wilson. This constable and the Missouri agent, Sheriff Reynolds, hastened to Nauvoo to make the arrest, where they ascertained that Joe Smith was on a visit to Rock River. They pursued him thither and succeeded in arresting him in Palestine Grove, in the county of Lee. The constable immediately delivered his prisoner to the Missouri agent and returned his warrant as having been executed. So that's the technicality, right? So the the Illinois agent, that's Harmon T. Wilson, he had a single arrest warrant to get Joseph Smith arrested and then hand him over to the possession of Sheriff Reynolds. As soon as Joseph Smith was arrested, he handed Joseph Smith over to Sheriff Reynolds. So the warrant <laughs> that uh, Harmon T. Wilson, Sheriff Wilson, was working under by, direct, by direction of Governor Ford of Illinois had been fulfilled. It was done. Ford continues, the agent started with his prisoner in the direction of Missouri, but on the road was met by a number of armed Mormons who captured the whole party and conducted them in the direction of Nauvoo. Farther on, they were met by hundreds of the Mormons coming to the rescue of their prophet, who conducted him in grand triumph to his own city. Cyrus Walker, the Whig candidate for Congress, was sent for to defend him as a lawyer. A writ of habeas corpus was sued out of the municipal court of Nauvoo. Mr. Walker appeared as his counsel and made a wonderful exertion in a speech three hours long to prove to the municipal court, composed of Joe Smith's tools and particular friends, he calls the Mormon elites Joseph Smith's tools and particular friends, that's what he's saying, that they had the jurisdiction to issue and act on the writ under the ordinance of their city. Continuing from further on in the page. The municipal court discharged Joe Smith from his arrest. The Missouri agent immediately applied to me for a militia force to renew it, and Mr. Walker came to the seat of government on the part of the Mormons to resist the application. This was only a short time before the election. I was indisposed from the first to call out the militia and inform Mr. Walker what my best opinion was then that the militia would not be ordered, but as many important questions of law were involved in the decision, I declined then to pronounce a definite opinion." It was afterwards, upon mature consideration, decided not to call out the militia. Now, that, hang on, I'm going to pause before finishing that sentence. What happened here is, when Joseph Smith was released on his writ of habeas corpus, Sheriff Reynolds wanted to call out the Illinois militia to go invade Nauvoo and forcibly arrest Joseph Smith and forcibly take him to Missouri. How do we think that would play out? 
right? So Governor Ford here says, <laughs> upon mature consideration, decided not to call out the militia. He says, because the writ had been returned as having been fully executed by the delivery of Joe Smith to the Missouri agent. See, that's the whole point. Sheriff Wilson was working under the direction of Governor Ford. The writ that Governor Ford swore out to have Joseph Smith transferred to Sheriff Reynolds, that had been fulfilled. Governor Ford was able to say, I have done my duty and just wash his hands of the situation and walk away. He concludes, with which Illinois had nothing to do except issue a new warrant if one had been demanded. The governor, in doing what he had done, had fulfilled his whole duty under the Constitution and the laws. And because Smith had not been forcibly rescued, but had been discharged under color of law by a court which had exceeded his jurisdiction, and it appeared that it would have been a dangerous precedent for the governor, whenever he supposed that the courts had exceeded their powers, to call out the militia to reverse and correct their judgments. Yet for not doing so, I was subjected to much unmerited abuse, end quote. So, yeah, that's the whole point. Governor Ford, <laughs> it, because Joseph Smith did not get sprung from the uh, custody of the sheriffs by the Nauvoo Legion, only the sheriffs were arrested by his legionnaires and then, you know, taken into Nauvoo. And then through the court process of the municipal court of Nauvoo, Joseph Smith was let out on his writ of habeas corpus because that had been done under the color of law. Governor Ford decided if I were to bring the militia in to overturn the ruling of that court of the municipal court of Nauvoo, that sets a dangerous precedent for the governor. Now, I cut a little bit from that chunk of reading because it's not relevant today, but it will be in coming episodes. Needless to say, after the hearing that we'll be going through next week, Governor Ford determined that he had completely fulfilled the duties of the warrant of arrest and that the municipal court in Nauvoo determined that Joe should be let free. And that was a binding decision. And that's that, right? I mean, Governor Ford, he didn't want to set the precedent of a state governor calling out the militia to overturn a court ruling. So he just left the whole situation alone. Now, as we progress further into Nauvoo and specifically Governor Ford's tenure as governor over Nauvoo Mormonism, we'll begin to see a pattern emerge that we saw happen in Missouri with Governor Lilburn Boggs. Now, let me preface this. The American sentiment of like anti-nobility, anti-ruling class, anti-monarchy, that rendered the officer of governor in many ways ceremonial for the first half of the 19th century. Governors often took a back seat on controversial issues within their states in order to allow localities to govern themselves and keep the power in the hands of city governments. If issues needed to move further up the chain of command, citizens were better off appealing to their congressmen and senators than they were to appealing to their governors. However, when situations like the Mormons inevitably arose, governors had full control of state militias, right? And they, they were in the primary position to put down these anti-government rebellions like the Mormons with military force. How might that look? But if we review in the, the Mormon War in Missouri, Governor Boggs had done this and taken this hands-off approach that Governor Ford was doing, and Governor Boggs ended up getting shot because of it. You see, Governor Ford of Illinois at this time, he was no moron. He knew that if he called out the Illinois militia to rein in the Mormon power, it would just be a repeat of the Missouri-Mormon War, and the Mormons would simply settle in a new area, probably in the Iowa Territory or somewhere further west, and then Governor Ford would be square in the crosshairs of a Danite, just like Boggs was. Because of this, you know politics that was going on, as well as the underlying tenor of the shadow military power interplay going on here, Ford handled the Mormons under Joseph Smith with kid gloves. He was much less generous after Joseph Smith's death. You know, he you know, possibly underestimated Bloody Brigham's power and character. But for the time being, in 1843 and 44 in Nauvoo, Governor Ford was treading lightly even though gross abuses of power were happening right in his state. But to be fair to Governor Ford, he wasn't responsible for the Mormon mess, right? Governor Ford inherited this entire issue from Governor Carlin, who had left office in 1842. And Governor Ford initially didn't even run for office. It was because the previous runner for the Democrat office in Illinois 
died when he was in, on his campaign and Governor Ford was nominated in, uh, unbeknownst to him at the time and won the ticket. Governor Carlin, that was the guy who had curried so much favor with the Mormons uh, and, and Joseph Smith specifically. So Governor Ford was in a predicament that was not of his own making. Most of it was due to Governor Carlin, his predecessor. Even more unfortunate for Governor Ford here, there were forces at play that he simply wasn't privy to. Right. I mean, Joseph Smith escaping state custody once again, that may have seemed like a relatively trivial issue, but Ford didn't know the larger plans in Joe's mind. He didn't know how far this theocratic empire was ready to go. To be even more fair to Governor Ford and everybody else, you know, negatively impacted by the Mormon theocracy in the early 1840s. They couldn't see the future, right? We have the hindsight of history to see how all of this played out. We know Utah history. We know what was birthed from these early Mormon theocratic movements underneath Joseph Smith. But the people at the time, they were acting upon their best judgment of the circumstances with limited information at the time. You know, really, I mean, that's what we're all doing, right? And we all justify our actions based on what we believe will bring good results. You know, good for us, good for our family, good for our religion, good for our community, good for our country, whatever it is that motivates us, right? It's a matter of somebody coming along with no scruples or regard for the happiness or well-being of their fellow human beings that we see anomalies like Joseph Smith come along and incite a revolution, it's interesting because we can all become victims to systems like this, right? As much as we like to think that we're all enlightened, you know, maybe we're all trying to be as skeptical as we possibly can be, you know, something like that. Therefore, we're immune to being co-opted like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young did to the early Mormons. But that's just not true. It doesn't matter the category, politics, religion, social justice issues, your favorite TV show. We can all be co-opted and coerced by the world around us. And we have very little control to stop these forces that are much larger than us, pushing and pulling us in all sorts of undesired directions. How does this come about, though? I mean, the thing is, <laughs> Joseph Smith was no idiot. He was an anomaly for sure, unique, a revolutionary uh, but he was no idiot. Sure, he was an uneducated, you know, he's a country bumpkin. He wasn't full of information or particularly well-read, but apologists who claim it miraculous that, you know, a barely literate teenager like Joseph Smith could produce the Book of Mormon, you know, it must have been done by the gift and power of God. In the same breath, they'll say that it's equally miraculous that Joe was able to build multiple cities and garner a following of over 10,000 people in an age before radio or television. And for all intents and purposes, Joseph Smith began a religious revolution. What the history of Mormonism tells us is that Joe was smart, and more importantly, he was clever. He was smart enough to surround himself with people much smarter than him who could carry out his will, regardless of how impractical that will may have been. He was clever enough to find his way out of any sticky situation. As Joe's following grew, it reached points of critical mass where, regardless of transpiring events or quote-unquote religious persecution, as they called it, the religion couldn't help but grow, and the elite ranks continually filled with more educated and more motivated people whose only goal was to be part of something bigger than themselves. It should be no wonder what set of circumstances led to Mormons being 3% of the American population today, but 18% of politicians. I find Governor Ford's commentary on the Mormon mindset and the people they kept as company particularly prescient, maybe even prophetic, considering the future of Mormonism for the 175 years after Ford's death. Quote, Thus, the Mormons were deluded and deceived by men who ought to have known and did know better. It was a common thing for this people to be eternally asking and receiving advice. If judicious and legal advice were given to them, they rejected it with scorn when it came in conflict with their favorite projects, for which reason all persons designing to use them made it a rule to find out what they were in favor of and advise them accordingly. In this mode, the Mormons relied for advice, for the most part upon the most corrupt of mankind, who would make no matter of conscience of advising them to their destruction as a means of gaining their favor. 
This has always been a difficulty with the Mormons and grew out of their blind fanaticism, which refused to see or to hear anything against their system, but more out of the corruption of their leaders, whose objects being generally roguish and rotten required corrupt and rotten advisors to keep them in countenance. End quote. Curtin McConkie. Curtin McConkie, anybody? Roguish, rotten, corrupt advisors. Joe seemed to be surrounded by them his entire life. One of them, Joseph Jackson, you know, who's currently amidst a shadow campaign to infiltrate the Mormons and help arrest Joseph Smith, at least, you know, he carried out his efforts undetected here so as to gain further favor in the eyes of the prophet, gain entrance into the Mormon elites. So his search company, well, the search company that he was part of, his company of the Destroying Angels, uh, they were not the party who found Joseph Smith because Jackson had apparently deliberately led them astray, at least according to his own count. However, they did learn of the prophet's return to the city, which was a relief to Jackson as he continued to carry out his infiltration plans. Quote, In the meantime, another party that had proceeded directly up the river met Joe, Wilson, and Reynolds, all in the custody of the sheriff of Lee County proceeding southwards. They escorted Joe to the city, and would not suffer the officers to take any other direction. This fact we learn and returned to the city. At Nauvoo, the writ of habeas corpus granted at Dixon was tried before the municipal court, and Joe released. Wilson and Reynolds then effected their escape from the city. Seeing all hopes of bringing Joe to justice baffled for the present, I determined to continue my game. End quote. Here's to playing the game. And that's going to do it for our episode today. Just want to let everybody know we are doing our NAMO home evening, our hangout. We try and do these monthly hangouts, but we're doing it a little unconventional this time. My friend Zach Law over on the Zach Relige uh, YouTube channel slash podcast has invited me to come and, and co-host an evening with him. And we're just going to double that up as our name of home evening. So if you want to come and hang out with us, we're going to get started on Monday. That's going to be the 11th of March, 311, 2019. You're going to find us on Zach Relige YouTube channel. That's Z-A-C-H, Zach Relige, R-I-L-E-G-E, Zach Relige. We're going to go hang out for a while and hopefully settle the debate of what the superior amber beer is. Uh, along with, you know, maybe some other less important subjects, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Add into that. Also, I'm going to be making a, uh, an upcoming appearance on the iFriends show. That is a, a good friend of mine, Jake Far Wharton. You've probably heard his voice on this podcast if you're a longtime listener. And if not, iFriends is a good time. Um, yeah, Jake invites me on, you know, every so often, and he's invited me to come on, hang out with him this upcoming episode. So, yeah, be checking out the iFriends.com or iFriendsShow.com podcast feed to come in, uh, and hang out with the big panel that Jake always puts together. We talk about headlines. It's a fun show. There's points. There's game. It's fun. Uh, yeah, and that should be do doing it for everything for today. Oh, one more thing. We have a new patron over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Jeff. Jeff is our newest patron. And as a huge thanks to Jeff, as well as to all of our patrons, you guys get an extra show every week, as well as an extended edition of the podcast that airs usually a couple of hours earlier than the regular feed. So if you want to tune into all the extra content, have access to our Nemo Home Evening Hangouts, get access to the Nemo book club where i'm reading through uh you know old mormon exposés and old mormon books with my commentary you can do that at patreon.com slash naked mormonism join the ranks of the awesome namo family over there and of course to jeff our new patron and all of the patrons thank you so much for pledging your hard-earned money to this show to ensure a timely and quality release every single week with that, we're going to shut it down. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find the contact page at nakedmormonism.com or you can just get in touch with me at nakedmormonism at gmail.com. I don't always plug that. Also, social media, Facebook, Twitter, you know, you know where to find me. You can Google. Google is a powerful tool. Use it to your best advantage. And with that, I will say thank you so much for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast as legal counsel. Music is written and performed by Jason Camo of a aloststateofmind.com and used with permission. Nick Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC, copyright 2019, all rights reserved.